Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Husey, and I'm Director of Strategic Deterrent Studies at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And I want to welcome you to our Nuclear Deterrence Series. Today, we are very excited to have Dr. Chris Ford and Dr. Susan Cook with us. Dr. Ford was a former Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Nonproliferation. Dr. Ford was also a member of the U.S. National Security Council staff and has written extensively on nuclear weapons policy, nonproliferation, arms control, and many other national security related topics. Dr. Susan Cook is a former Director of Proliferation Strategy at the National Security Council. She specializes in policy issues regarding arms control and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. I want to welcome you, Dr. Ford and Dr. Cook. Thank you for joining us today. And before we go into questions, I'd like to give each of you a few moments to talk about us, about your current work and the issues that you think are serious in terms of nuclear deterrence. So I will start with you, Dr. Ford, and welcome. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back as uh, a part of your, your breakfast series. Looking forward to doing these in person, hopefully in the, in the very near future now. Um, I thought what I would do for my contribution today is say a couple of, uh, make a couple of points just to sort of get the discussion going before we get to what will be, I'm sure, the really fun part. And that, of course, is the, the Q&A with, uh, with you and with your, your audience. Um, my first point has to do with arms control verification. And sort of ironically, it's, uh, it's sort of a point about what I don't really think it's very helpful to talk about much right now. Um, let me try to unpack that a bit. Um, I think it's really hard to have much of a really useful discussion about verification of a future arms control agreement at the moment for the reason that we don't really know what the limits are that we would be asking verification to verify compliance with, if that makes any sense. Um, I think a, a discussion of verification in the abstract can be pretty sterile without talking about uh, what one is actually verifying. Um, the point of verification, of course, is is not to conduct a, you know, sort of a general assessment of somebody's nuclear weapons program. It's to offer at least some you know, minimum degree, hopefully better than that, but at least some minimum degree of assurance that one will detect a violation of whatever limits it is that one is imposing in an agreement. So for that reason, um, I, I tend to think we spend a little bit too much time in some quarters discussing specific verification provisions out in front of whether or not uh, we have any idea what the particular limits are that uh, that will be verifying. I mean, things like uh, exchanging telemetry data can be extremely useful in certain contexts if you want to verify uh, missile performance. Uh, that's the whole point. Um, but it doesn't tell you much about uh, uh, you know, what the overall number of warheads your adversary is. So telemetry as a way to verify a warhead cap, it doesn't make a lot of sense. By the same token, if you had a, uh, some kind of a widget that could tell you whether a, an identified object that was entering or leaving a particular facility was in fact a nuclear weapon, that would be very useful for uh, verifying a cap, for instance, um, but wouldn't tell you anything at all about the delivery systems upon which such devices might be mounted. So I guess the verification question I think is, is I mean, I don't wanna say it's secondary in importance because it's extraordinarily important, but it's secondary in sequencing. Um, and I also don't know that we get a lot of value at the moment about trying to relitigate what either should or shouldn't have gone into past arms control agreements because we're going to have different arms control agreements in the future. New START has now been extended. Uh, it can't be extended um, after, you know, beyond the five years that that has just been agreed. Um, and whatever comes next is going to look somewhat different. And so until we know what it actually looks like, I find it very difficult to have much of a conversation about verification. Um, so, so let me just flag that as a way to perhaps direct uh, our discussions in a slightly different direction. Um, I, I would also argue that uh, we need to keep in mind, we, we do need to keep in mind going forward, the question that is often overlooked in, uh, at least in the abstract, as we come up upon arms control agreements. And that is the challenge of compliance enforcement. You know, what happens if a violation is actually detected? Now, this isn't usually something that is spelled out in a treaty itself, um, in part because well, material breaches tend to lead to the collapse of treaties. And so having things specifically in them about compliance enforcement uh, isn't always all that helpful. Um, so it's not really a treaty law question, I suppose, but it's an extremely important one. I mean, I, I am of the school of thought uh, that no 
no treaty violation is unimportant. Um, there are those who disagree with this, but my view is that it is entirely possible for a pattern of small violations, each of which I suppose could be, you know, in a sense, in, almost insignificant in itself, to add up yeah, as a pattern, if you will, to a major problem uh, as the parties decide how and to what extent they can live with each other within a framework. Um, but it's also true that not all violations are created equal, and it's clearly possible to have some that are more dangerous and troubling than others. So I don't know that you can say in advance exactly how one should react to uh, a violation in the abstract, because there is no generic violation. Um, but I do think it's really critical to remember all the way along um, that you have to have some concept in mind of what to do in the event that the other party cheats. And if you're not willing to do something, if the other party commits a violation, there's really not that much point in having good verification or frankly in having a treaty in the first place. Um, in my view, not being willing to uh, to respond to violations in ways that go beyond just finger wagging, um, that is a sign of fundamental unseriousness about arms control. I mean, if arms control matters, and I believe that it does, it necessarily matters whether arms control agreements are violated. Verification protocols are not for historians so that they can document when everything went south. They are for security minded national leaders in the present day to, to give them at least some ability to try to respond to security threats that are presented when others do not comply with what they've said they would comply with. So someone who doesn't care about violations, which is of course, you know, one of the surest signs of that is passivity when they happen. Uh, someone who doesn't care about those things has no right to pretend to be serious about arms control. Now that's not going to be guidance that's going to be really crisp and useful with respect to any particular treaty negotiation, but I think if we don't have those principles in mind in the back of our heads, we are making a very great mistake. So I would urge that everyone, you know, sort of little post-it note in, the, in your brain someplace for, for these kinds of questions. My final point, however, um, has to do in a sense, by, by, reminding, by reminding us that, that arms control is fundamentally about security, that brings me to my third point. And that is, uh, I worry uh, about the more structural challenges. I mean, more than I worry about verification at the moment or, or particular provisions, I worry more about the structural challenges right now of whether and to what degree we can move, we can move forward with our, first, our potential arms control partners, given uh, some of their approaches to strategic competition in the first place right now. And that doesn't mean that we can't, it just means that we have to be open-minded, uh, open-eyed, I should say, about how difficult it's likely to be. Um, in this respect, I think strategic visions are really important. Uh, Russia is maybe the easier case, although that's not saying a lot. I um, mean, no one here on this audience, Peter, needs to be told about Moscow's terrible record of arms control compliance, its provocative strategic and non-strategic nuclear expansion that's underway today, um, and the incessant threats that it makes against its neighbors. Uh, but these things aren't just accidents. I, I fear that Russia's international posture on these things uh, represents really a sort of revisionist competitive vision that is quite at odds with the kind of focus upon peaceful coexistence that made possible the pioneering efforts in arms control in the 1970s, for instance. Um, and, and I, I, I don't know exactly what that means for us, but it certainly raises, well, it should point us to challenges and, and uh, uh, you know, temper our expectations about what can be done in negotiating with Moscow going forward. Um, but I think even more problematic is China. Uh, it of course is building up its arsenal at a furious pace. It's ramping up threats against its neighbors. And it doesn't even, unlike Moscow, doesn't even pretend to wish to negotiate. On the contrary, Beijing frankly sneers at the idea of arms control negotiation with us. Um, then rather than seeming like it wants a stable international environment, it also would appear that China is working very hard to change that environment, uh, not just for its own relative advantage within the system, uh, as, as arguably Russia is trying to do, but actually in a way to, to, to implement bigger objectives of almost replacing the relative, replacing that system, replacing the relatively you know, peaceable post-Cold War world um, with one in which China becomes the unquestioned hegemon in Asia and displaces the United States more broadly as in effect the central power of the global system. Um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to the question, but it's worth worrying about whether it is actually possible to imagine arms control with this China any more than it was possible to imagine arms control, despite our good intentions at the time, with uh, say Japan or Germany in the 1930s, for instance. Now, I do hope that there is a way forward here, but, but I do, I am concerned that the Chinese Communist Party is in effect working rather hard to create worrisome historical resemblances here. Um, 
And I think this, well, another example is how China's trajectory creates potential ripple effects with regard to uh, what can be imagined with regard even to successful US-Russia negotiations. And for that, as an example, I would take the Obama administration's 2013 suggestion of trying to negotiate a way down to about a thousand operational warheads with the Russians. Uh, now that didn't go anywhere because Moscow wasn't, you know, wasn't interested. Um, but from the perspective of 2021, um, one can't, I think, help being struck by the fact that that level of 1,000 warheads is actually precisely the number that was identified in a Global Times article uh, last spring in China. That is to say by a paper owned by the People's Daily, which is itself the mouthpiece of the CCP, um, arguing for a 1,000 warhead target uh, for China itself. Um, I would also refer readers, if you subscribe to U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings, because otherwise you can't read it, it's paywalled. Uh, but uh, if you uh, check out Admiral Richard's contribution in the February 2021 piece, you will notice he flags the possibility that China may not, may not merely necessarily double, which was the previous assessment, but perhaps even triple or quadruple the size of its arsenal over the next decade. That is a very dramatic trajectory. And, uh, um, and if you compare that sort of signaling now that we're getting about the potential Chinese end state with that thousand warhead objective for US-Russia negotiations in 2013, uh, one wonders what, what one does with that. I, I certainly would imagine that neither Washington nor Moscow is likely to be very keen to accept a Chinese bid for strategic nuclear parity by cutting down to a level up to which China is presently furiously building. So these present challenges. And I think ultimately, just to conclude, I think ultimately some of these challenges stem not so much from the technical back and forth about what arms control can or should actually say. Um, so it's not a sort of a treaty drafters problem. I think it's a bigger picture strategist problem in the sense that I worry that the logic of Sino-Russian strategic ambitions casts a really dramatic shadow over the future of the arms control enterprise, at least for a while, uh, raising questions about whether those two powers are actually ones that want the kind of geostability, geopolitical stability that we have made it the purpose of arms control for many, many years to try to, to achieve and to perpetuate. Um, and that's where global visions matter in the sense, look historically back in the 1920s, for instance, there was a, you know, a degree of success in major power arms control negotiating, um, using negotiations to manage competition, if you will, and to, to at least partially cope with readjustments in global power balances in a way that helped make conflict less likely. And they did this informed by memories of what happens when it goes badly in World War One, And they did it with a modest degree of success. But the whole you know, things were rather different in the 30s, um, but this, the 20s was an example in which the major participants had views of the world and its future that were, you know, modestly enough aligned that there was, there, the, the Venn diagrams overlapped enough to make negotiations possible. And similarly, in the 1970s, um, the Soviets and the United States certainly didn't like each other, um, or, you know, and they probably still entertained ideas that each would supersede the other in the world. Um, but they spoke openly of peaceful coexistence and recognized that their nuclear standoff didn't leave them much choice but to manage risks and to negotiate ways to channel that rivalry into less catastrophically dangerous directions. And so their visions, while very different of the future world, were still, you know, op, you know, functionally speaking, compatible enough to permit negotiation. And of course, the 1990s, when all sorts of things were negotiated as well, both multilaterally and bilaterally, um, those were also periods in which, uh, in which the, the broad strategic visions of the major players seemed to align at least enough to make things possible. So, so that was a good thing, but the contrast point, of course, and I alluded to this before, is the 1930s, uh, characterized by very sharp and, and at that point growing divergences between the Western democracies and the strategic visions of Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and imperial militarist Japan. Uh, and with those differing visits, envisionments of the future, if you will, uh, different pictures of what the strategic future should look like. Arms control really wasn't possible and ultimately what had been done before collapsed. And I don't know where our present day stands um, along that sort of continuum of you know, compatible versus utterly incompatible strategic visions, but it's something that I think we do need to be struggling with as we think about the future of arms control. And I'll conclude with a quick anecdote because it was it made me smile um, about the importance of those kinds of visions of what the world should look like in arms control and how they can affect negotiations. In the 1920s, there was a, a big disarmament conference sponsored by the League of Nations. And at one point there was a discussion recorded between a British representative and a Spanish admiral 
uh, about uh, how to do naval force reductions and limitations. And they both agreed that it was important for a treaty to fix in place specific force ratios between naval fleets um, set on the basis of uh, you know, a particular reference year that would become kind of the, the, the point to lock in uh, for their relative power in the future. And the British, of course, suggested 1921. Uh, as a good year to, to take as the reference point for fixing naval ratios. The Spanish Admiral responded with, well, what about 1588, the year of the Spanish Armada? And, and I think it makes me smile too, but, uh, but it does illustrate a broader point, And that is that visions of the strategic future are incredibly important to what you can do and what is even possible in arms control. And I would certainly not say that arms control is impossible, but we have a great challenge in front of us in struggling with what appears to be some really dangerous and incompatible visions of the strategic future that are coming out of the Kremlin and out of the CCP's leadership compound in Zhongnanhai. So I would urge us to spend a little bit less time on the technical pieces of arms control and much more on this strategic picture, because if we can't you know, untie that Gordian knot somehow. Uh, it doesn't matter how clever uh, our drafters might be. It isn't going to work. So we have a really big picture challenge here that, that I would urge us to pay a lot of attention to. I'm sorry to go a little bit long, but uh, I wanted to make sure I got that in. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Those are perfect remarks. And now over to you to Susan. Um, thank you very much, Peter. Um, and um, I too thank you for inviting me here and look forward to being able to for me, just walk down the hill uh, for some breakfast meetings in the future. And uh, thanks, Chris, for those very illuminating and wise thoughts on arms control. Uh, I'll focus on nonproliferation. And as you just discussed in arms control, uh, so too in proliferation issues, it's uh, I can much more readily identify the challenges than I can the opportunities. Uh, we're all very familiar with the immediate horizontal proliferation problems of Iran and North Korea. Uh, less frequently discussed are the broader risks of a potential failure of the nuclear nonproliferation treaty system uh, that um, I think could well happen unless we act quickly, quickly and well. Let me, let me start with uh, North Korea. Some years ago, Victor Cha uh, described negotiating with North Korea in terms of the movie Groundhog Day. The same cycle occurred over and over again. We come to an agreement with North Korea, multilateral agreement. They would quickly violate it. We, the other parties would offer a combination of carrots and sticks to induce them to return to negotiations, would get a new agreement, they would quickly violate it, and so on and so on. And that, that cycle held for almost uh, more than 20 years, from uh, 1985 to 2018. The parade of failed agreements stopped during the Obama administration, which refused to deal with North Korea unless and until that would be promising. And so for the eight years of the Obama administration, it wasn't promising and it didn't happen. Uh, the Trump administration took a very different approach, including uh, and above all, uh, holding um, long sought summit meetings with, uh, with Kim Jong-un. But so the approaches were very different, but the outcomes regrettably were very similar, if not identical. Uh, meanwhile, North Korea's nuclear uh, missile capability has uh, steadily grown. Uh, we estimate that its nuclear stockpile has gone from four to six warheads in 2008 to roughly 45 to 60 now. Um, it successfully tested a thermonuclear warhead intercontinental ballistic missile. In at the 2018 Singapore summit, Kim promised uh, to stop testing long range missiles and nuclear warheads. He's held to that. However, he has been very active in testing shorter range systems, which pose a growing threat to our allies, Japan and South Korea, and cannot be ignored. The Biden administration, as you know, recently completed a review of North Korea policy. We know almost nothing about its findings, uh, at least publicly. 
that I've seen. Uh, but it seems to look towards incremental steps by advocating the ultimate goal of denuclearization. Interestingly, I don't know what to make of it. It refers to complete denuclearization as opposed to complete verifiable and irreversible denuclearization. And those are two adjectives that are important to me, but who knows? Um, the approach seems to be a middle ground between Obama's strategic patience and, and Trump's grand bargain. Still very difficult to be optimistic about the chances of success, uh, no matter what the Biden approach might be. The key as it has been for years probably lies with China and to an extent Russia. If China in particular took a firm line against North Korea's nuclear and missile programs and vigorously enforced UN sanctions, that would be our best chance of the regime finally acceding uh, for the sake of its survival and that of the country. But there's no sign of that happening. And uh, indeed the deterioration of US relations with China um, and with Russia uh, make the chances appear worse than normal. Chances for progress are better with Iran, but that doesn't mean they're good. Uh, the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which I will refer to as the JCPOA, or will be here all morning, um, is definitely flawed. Uh, uh, constraints on Iran's nuclear program would begin to be relaxed within eight years, and that was five years ago, um, or six years ago. Uh, the centrifuges dismantled under the agreement were, uh, the parts were allowed to remain within Iran, close at hand. Some Iranian enrichment could be conducted, albeit in limited amounts and limited levels. And there was no treatment of Iran's missile programs. Still, for me at least, the JCPOA was better than nothing. It provided some constraints in the near term and a potential basis for longer term, stronger measures. And we have unfortunately seen what happens when after we withdrew from the JCPOA. Iran complied with the agreement for three and a half years, roughly. And then in May 2018, we withdrew, uh, claiming, advocating a much better deal, but that didn't happen. The other parties remained in the agreement and acting alone we had little or no influence. Beginning in May 2019, Iran, the, Iran announced the first of a series of incremental violations of the agreement, pro continuously promising a return to full compliance if the US lifts the sanctions we imposed when we withdrew. Uh, in December 2020, a new Iranian law required even more violation. Iran now has, we estimate, about 10 times the amount of enriched uranium that was allowed under the JCPOA. It's operating some advanced centrifuges, has enriched, including at a banned location, enriched some uranium at to 60% and has constrained IAEA monitoring. This year, of course, the Biden administration began indirect talks with Iran and the other JCPOA parties. We seek the strengthening of the agreement, but that seems very unlikely. More feasible might be a U.S. return to the, viol uh, to the agreement, an end to at least some Iranian violations, and the lifting of many sanctions. Maybe feasible, but is it acceptable to either any of the parties? Now, continuation and growth of the North Korean nuclear and missile threat, emergence of an actual Iranian nuclear threat would be extremely damaging in and of themselves whether they also lead to broader proliferation may depend heavily on the credibility and effectiveness of US extended deterrence. Uh, when the NPT was signed, several of our key allies made clear that they would become parties only if they were confident of US nuclear protection. That basic bargain has been long forgotten, but it once again is highly relevant. 
South Korea, Japanese, Australian, and or European withdrawal from the NPT because of a lack of confidence in US extended deterrence against Russia, China, North Korea, Iran could be disastrous for the NPT. We must strengthen those commitments in both word and deed. Regional and global stability depends upon it. We might also look closely at extending our nuclear umbrella to Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states. The obstacles to doing so are immense, but the need is acute. If Iran resumes its nuclear weapons efforts or, or succeeds in its nuclear weapons effort, the incentive for Saudi Arabia and other neighbors to go nuclear would be very strong. Credible US extended deterrence requires strong policy and clear statements of intent. It helps that the administration has emphasized the importance of our alliances that we're again engaged with our partners, that President Biden's first face-to-face -face international meetings were with the Prime Minister of Japan and the President of South Korea. It's also essential that the President reject no first use, sole use, and any other declaratory policy that would weaken our deterrent threats. We must also have the forces to make our deterrent threats stronger and more credible. More than 50 years ago, President de Gaulle questioned whether the United States would risk New York for Paris. Now many in South Korea and Japan, and worse, perhaps North Korea and China, are asking the same about Seoul and Tokyo. Viewed from this perspective, the new low-yield SLBM warhead options, an eventual nuclear sea launch cruise missile, would strengthen, not weaken, counterproliferation. The same is true of all legs of the strategic triad. As Brad Roberts recently said, the choice is to modernize or disarm. There is no third option. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Susan and Dr. Ford. Let me uh, go into a few questions here and go into the issues a little deeper. I want to first start with you, Chris. Um, China is planning to, as you noted from Admiral Richard, perhaps tripling its nuclear arsenal over the next within the decade. And from a strategic perspective, how do you view the Chinese buildup of nuclear weapons? Whether they double or continue double, what are the implications in terms of what the Chinese are up to? Sure. Um, well, I, let me flag also uh, just quickly in, in a sense as a way to sort of build upon um, the, the observations of our STRATCOM commander. Um, there is a uh, there's some recent reporting that has come out just in the last couple of months on uh, you know, what may be another piece of this puzzle, and it's it's not clear yet, but a very worrying one. Um, the Chinese government has announced plans for essentially to build an entirely new plutonium production pipeline, um, allegedly, of course, for its civilian nuclear reactor program uh, to produce breeder reactors and and burn. Uh, plutonium in them and produce plutonium from that and to burn that. Um, you know, it's a it's a an effort to sort of resurrect thinking about it, a plutonium economy that has been circulating off and on for many years um, in the nuclear technology business. Uh, most countries in the West have tried this and either failed at it or realized ahead of time before failure that it's not particularly useful or economical. But the Chinese have just announced that they are all in for producing a uh, a new plutonium production uh, apparatus. In effect which if it follows the plans that they have outlined could in relatively short order put enough essentially divertible weapons usable plutonium into China's government hands to enable an even faster expansion of, uh, of their arsenal. And that I think you know, can only be additionally worrying on top of all of the things that we were concerned about before. Um, the uh, the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center put something out on this recently. And I believe their numbers suggest that it could be the, the, number, the amounts of plutonium fairly conservatively estimated could be enough to support the construction of as many as 1,200 or more um, warheads beyond what would be possible otherwise. And since there is no suggestion that China is in any way short of uranium uh, for, uh, for such purposes, you know, that could be essentially another way to, you know, a, a further uh, expansion of the expansion, if that makes any sense. So, so a great question. Um, strategic implications wise, um, I guess there are probably a number of the different potential ones. You know, most obviously from the U.S. Um, U.S. strategic planning perspective, uh, would be a great augmentation of what uh, Otto von Bismarck in the 19th century once called the nightmare of coalitions. 
Uh, and that is to say, how is it that we do our strategic planning in light of the possibility that these two alleged strategic partners of uh, uh, Russia and China um, might both each independently be a nuclear peer? How do we approach uh, you know, our own planning for crisis or conflict or, or even how to just deter, which is even more you know, important antecedent to all of that? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but it is a challenge that we've never had to face before. Um, it is also a three-way challenge, which raises all sorts of game theoretical problems of how you deter. Um, in that context, it raises the, the, the risks of, uh, of deterrence failing through accident or miscalculation or error or whatever it may be. It just creates an incalculably more dangerous strategic situation and one in which the numbers of weapons would be such that if deterrence were to fail, the consequences would be even more catastrophically damaging than before. Uh, it's been a long time since there were that many nuclear weapons in the world. Both we and the Russians have done a great job of coming down enormously from our Cold War peaks. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can only, I mean, there is no upside <laughs> to uh, just stirring the pot and uh, uh, adding to this problem in the way that the Chinese government seems to be seems to be doing. Um, another piece of this, and that's just a strategic piece, a second piece would be from the perspective of uh, regional or theater worries. Um, I worry a lot that, uh, especially in combination with sophisticated modern anti-access and area denial capabilities, uh, a ever larger Chinese nuclear arsenal could increase the temptation that leaders in Beijing might feel to use all of that military power as what I think of as an offensive nuclear umbrella. I mean, we Americans tend to think of nuclear umbrellas as being defensive ones. It's, you know, it helps keep Estonians from ceasing to exist in the face of aggressive Soviet or Russian power, if you will. Um, but one could also in theory use a nuclear umbrella as an offensive umbrella. That is to say, to create space in which no one dares to, to, to intervene against aggression that you might contemplate against a, against a neighbor. And so building up China's capability to do that even more effectively than it's already working very hard to do cannot be anything but a terrible thing for international peace and security, for China's neighbors, for the democracies of the world, and certainly for US interests. So that's a downside as well. And the final piece is that for my friends and colleagues in the disarmament community, uh, there is nothing but nothing to do but be utterly dismayed by the fact that after a generation of extraordinary progress since George H.W. Bush negotiated the, the START agreement in 1991 uh, in reducing arsenals and trying to put some of the most dangerous aspects of nuclear competition behind us and move slowly and fitfully but, but importantly towards disarmament, um, anyone who still hopes to achieve the world a world without nuclear weapons cannot but be just utterly dismayed by where China is going because nothing about what they're doing is going to make that world anything but incredibly more difficult ever to see. And we should lament it for all of those reasons. Uh, that easily brings us into a question for Susan. And that is, what is your sense of the impact of the Chinese buildup? Albeit it's not as transparent as we would like, but what impact does that have on not only global non-proliferation efforts or counterproliferation efforts, but with respect to the two countries you mentioned, Iran and North Korea? Well, it's, it's clearest, I think, um, and uh, most disturbing with uh, North Korea, that um, in, in addition to the dangers that Chris pointed out, I fear that uh, the Chinese nuclear buildup will make uh, North Korea increasingly confident that we would never act against it. And, uh, and the consequences of that confidence would obviously be very severe. Uh, it's harder for me to see a direct impact uh, on Iran, uh, ex except as part of the overall uh, global deterioration of the climate. But North Korea, very specific. Thank you, uh, Susan, for that. I want to ask you both, how do you bring China into discussions into a formal arms control process? And particularly, how does Russia play in that? Because you could have two bilateral discussions, United States and Russia, the United States and China. But on the other hand, at some point, you probably are going to have to coordinate the three. So Susan, why don't you continue? And I'll help. Well, where, I, where do you go with this? I, I share what I think is Chris's 
his pessimism about the chances in the near term for any arms limitation talks with China. I think our best chance uh, are to seek a very serious strategic stability discussions for their own sake. Uh, Chris has outlined well all the challenges to regional and strategic stability from, from China. And um, also as perhaps leading eventually to arms limitation talks. I think we should do the same, the strategic stability talks, but separately with, with Russia. Uh, it's, the ground is not yet uh, ready for trilateral. It will be hard enough to get them underway with China and to get Russia dealing seriously with us. Chris, what about your uh, thoughts on that? Well, I, I, think think I, that. I think I share uh, Susan's perspective on that. Um, I mean, I guess to, to underline the point that we shouldn't assume that there is nothing to be done just because we want to, because we can't make progress thanks to Chinese intransigence with actual arms control talks. Maybe we can, but I, as I say, I'm, I'm not super, <laughs> I'm not very optimistic about it, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing to do. And there may be, as Susan says, important things that we can do in terms of, um, man, I, I would say managing risks. Uh, I mean, not even necessarily, you can do a lot in the arms control arena in theory without numerical, you know, limits or cuts or, or even verification protocols or whatever else it may be attached to them. Um, there may be confidence building things, there may be transparency things, there may be engagements that we can perhaps leverage going forward that will make, I mean, the Chinese are terrible at negotiating such things. Um, they have no experience of it. That's not an excuse, it's just a description. Um, uh, they have very little background of this, although not zero. My understanding is that they actually do have a sort of mini arms control framework with the Russians under which there's a launch notification protocol of some sort between them so that they don't end up getting into a war across their, their, their border. Um, and, and I think there may be some very limited base inspection protocol. So the idea of having a negotiation of sorts with someone you worry about strategically is not entirely foreign to people in Beijing, um, but their interest is principally in building up their power. And I suspect they will not be terribly interested in in numerical discussions until they've, you know, at least come up to our level, if not beyond, which is a terribly worrisome and depressing and problematic thought. But that doesn't mean that we can't talk about something short of that, either bilaterally or perhaps on a broader basis. And, and if you're talking about transparency and confidence building and mutual understanding and, and building a little bit of a sort of diplomatic slash military culture of strategic stability engagement, you can do that bilaterally, you can do that trilaterally, you can do that across the five, you can do that across eight. Uh, you know, there may be possibilities here that, that we, you know, that good could be done um, without entirely throwing in the towel. Um, but I think at the moment, if you're talking about numerical stuff, uh, you have a Chinese regime that is fiercely opposed to arms control and devoted to building up an enormous nuclear arsenal, which is a catastrophe, I think, for the world. Susan, let me ask you a question in light of the Chinese building up of its nuclear weapons, the Iranian question on the JCPOA and what North Korea is doing, where should the United States concentrate on the non-proliferation area? That's my question for you. And Chris, after that, I'd like you to ask the answer. Why did the denuclearization program or proposals on North Korea fail? I wanna start with Susan. Um, I, I think we have to, concentrate on uh, all the greatest non-proliferation challenges. Uh, North Korea and Iran, uh, perhaps not, certainly not because we expect success, although we have, but from the standpoint of our allies, we must do whatever we can, and ourselves, we must do whatever we can to seek a positive outcome and be seen to be doing that. Uh, I think we, you know, we've seen that well with the reaction of, of our allies to our effort to return to dealing with Iran. Uh, the appointment of Sung Kim as a uh, special envoy for North Korea. Uh, we 
also um, can't forget, again, the role of Russia and China in aiding and abetting horizontal proliferation and their own vertical proliferation. Uh, and that comes back, I think, to what I think is more of an opportunity. Uh, and, and that's I'm just going to say the same thing of uh, the strategic stability talks. Um, that uh, all of those efforts are just extremely important. Um, a near term outcome? Eh, probably not, but essential nonetheless. Chris, over to you. Uh, I, I'm not, but as I say, I, I think, uh, I, I hope you weren't expecting there to be all sorts of frisson of tension between Susan and me. On the <laughs> uh, I, if so, we're probably Just disappointing your up. audience. <laughs> yeah, we're disappointing your audience gravely. I, I, I don't have a lot to add to that. I mean, I would say in terms of, I mean, here's, this is the strategic vision uh, focus again. I, I fear that the simplest answer as to why the North Korean talks failed is because fundamentally the Kim regime doesn't want to get rid of these weapons. Uh, it has built them for a reason. And I, I personally don't think that that reason is to defend themselves from the United States because they weren't having any trouble deterring us from invading them as it were uh, for decades and decades and decades. Um, they did a perfectly good job of that. Um, there was never any prospect of that happening. Um, so, you know, it's for another reason. And that reason probably has to do with a combination of simple status. Um, they want to be perceived as a big dog in the world, uh, far out of proportion to their actual merits. And this is the way that they seem to have fixated upon in the way that cheap bullies do uh, to, to show off uh, their, uh, themselves. Um, but also a more sinister potential problem, and that is the challenge of decoupling. Um, and, uh, you know, I worry that part of this may be that the Kim regime has always anticipated that once they can present a, a you know, an unanswerable threat to the American homeland, we will be, um, for all the reasons that people uh, worried about the United States, and the Susan sort of alluded to this before, um, you know, not coming to our allies' aid because of threats, you know, would, would you in fact defend Seoul if it meant losing New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco? Um, the, the Kim regime wants the answer to that be, of course not. Um, they want to decouple us from the allies that they seek to threaten, and this is a very traditional approach to doing that. Uh, we went to a lot of trouble in, in, in Central Europe during the 1960s and 70s to set up elaborate architectures to keep that perception from fueling aggression and driving our allies to conclude that they needed their own nuclear weapons. Um, the, the Kim regime is uh, you know, sort of recreating a witch's brew of challenges in that respect through their, their weapons program. And ultimately I fear that it stems to some degree from uh, aggressive intentions toward the South. Um, it is important to them that we not be there to defend the South if, if the balloon went up and we should all be worried about that. But the bottom line is they didn't want to disarm. And so shockingly, they didn't agree to disarm. No, I, I, my view is that the Chinese may have had something to do with that too, with using the North Koreans as a leverage to get us out of the peninsula. Um, I have two questions for Dr. Cook. And, there, and I'd like, Chris, you can come in on this. And before we go to questions from the audience, there are two issues that concern me. And that is the Russians have a very large breakout capability, upwards of what Mark Schneider and Jim Howe talk about, five and 6,000 strategic warheads, given their current 520 SNDVs. So they're not even near the 700 limit under New START. What's the significance of that? Because we in this country, if we max out Minuteman and the D5 on the subs, we can go to about 3,000 warheads, about double where we are today. And depending on your view of things, that may be sufficient. But that's, that's, a, that's a big issue, which I'd like Dr. Cook to talk to. And, then, and I got one more after that, but go ahead, Susan. And Chris, um, you can comment as well once Susan is done. It's certainly a big issue, um, but it's not the one I'm most, most concerned about. Uh, uh, first, as, as far as strategic upload and the disparity, um, yes, that is a concern. We can, we can upload a fair amount, uh, the question, but less than the Russians. Uh, and the question that is unanswerable is um, how 
how consequential is the disparity. Uh, if, if I had my way, I would go back to start two and eliminate uh, multiple warhead ICBMs. Um, thought it was a great idea at the time. I think it's still a great idea. It looked briefly achievable in the early 1990s and it doesn't look remotely achievable now. But some more, you know, could we do more constraints on, um, on MERV potential? Uh, doing things like returning to the old star warhead counting rule where uh, ICBMs were attributed for the number of warheads to which they had been actually tested, not the number that they carried, uh, I think would be very important. And uh, other, other constraints on, on Mervyn. I am, my greatest concern actually is from um, the enormous disparity in shorter range systems. Uh, because of the, the danger they post, uh, present to our allies, the political impossibility of us from responding in kind. Uh, the days when we could base uh, intermediate and short range systems uh, on the territory of our allies, uh, I think are, are gone. Uh, but we can strengthen our extended deterrence threats uh, make clear the importance of our strategic deterrence as part of the defense of our allies. Not, not hurt things badly by ill-chosen changes to our declaratory policy, like no first use or sole use, and uh, and also restore robust systems of exercises. It's no accident that. North Korea objects to our joint exercise with South Korea. And precisely because they object, we should do it. Yeah. Those, those are, if I could just jump in, those are great points. I would add an additional thing to keep in mind as we think about uh, um, you know, things like upload capability and so forth. I mean, uh, how the upload numbers, you know, I don't have in my head exactly how they all come out. I would urge you, Peter, you mentioned uh, uh, Miniman 3 and subs. I would add bombers to that and make sure that we not forget that we've got an upload capacity there as well. I don't know exactly how the numbers mash out. It may be indeed that the Russians have an advantage if everyone were to go berserk in this respect. Um, but to some degree, because we do have an ability to do a degree of that, we might both end up at a much higher level of armament, but still not dramatically off from each other. Uh, so, you know, it seems like a, a losing game that I hope the Russians appreciate. But more important than that, even over time, is I would point to productive capacity in the nuclear infrastructure. Um, and, you know, so once you get to that, whatever kind of stalemate you might imagine where everyone has uploaded everything, uh, you know, there's not a single rack on a single bomber or a single, you know, MERV bus that is not occupied with a thermonuclear device. It's a horrifying thought. But, um, you know, when, once you get to that point, no one's got any arrows in their quiver except to the degree that they can produce more. And that is where we need to always remember the degree to which the productive infrastructure is a critical piece of deterrence by which I, I don't mean that we necessarily need to be cranking things out. I think we don't need that at the moment. But I think if we were to allow our infrastructure to deteriorate to the point where we couldn't uh, adapt to a strate changing strategic environment by producing more or producing something new if we needed to, God help us. Um, if we signaled that we were out of the business of being able to do design and production um, effectively, resiliently, robustly, and if need be rapidly, that would be a signal that would absolutely delight our strategic adversaries because it would be telling them that don't worry, all you gotta do is wait. Or if you get up to that built up stalemate, they can keep building, if they could keep building faster than we, we're screwed. So the infrastructure, the, the physical capital of our productive infrastructure and the nuclear weapons business, the human capital, which is even more important, all of these things are incredibly important to maintaining our deterrence. And we need to keep a laser-like focus upon remembering that because we don't do a good job of remembering it. We, you know, it's, it's easy to debate 
things that fly and roar out of silos and, uh, and, and the actual weapons themselves. It is, a, it is not an intuitively obvious thing to remember that scientists and technicians and young STEM educated people from across the United States with security clearances and testing yeah. and diagnostic arrays in far flung portions of American deserts, you know, all of these things are critical to our deterrence and we, we fail to maintain them and keep them robust and resilient, I think at very much our peril. Let me ask uh, Dr. Cook and Dr. Ford, let me ask you a question from one of our audience. I've combined three questions. And the question came in is, instead of looking at the number of weapons, to what extent does the development of technologies of artificial intelligence, cyber and hypersonics impact the strategic nuclear or nuclear environment where it's gonna very much change the way we look at the strategic balance. Susan, why don't you start on that? Well, um, the, the breadth and importance of advanced technologies, uh, some of which like hypersonics uh, can come close to the nuclear world, others um, not necessarily. Again, underscore, I'm joining one note here, the importance of strategic stability talks about that would discuss all the challenges to strategic stability, not just the traditional ones. And um, I'm, I'm not optimistic. There's something called, uh, gosh, at least 10 years ago, maybe more, Budapest Convention on Cyber Crime. Uh, and, you know, and this is, um, mafia crime, not uh, not state crime, and uh, Russia and China never signed on. Yeah, well, and and that one was, I mean, that one was a kind of easy one to say. This is a bad thing. That's about all it does. No, they wouldn't sign on. Uh, but we have to see what we can we can do, and and to maybe help them to start seeing that the threats to strategic stability can redound on them. Mm -hmm. It's not all one way. As far as more traditional nuclear arms control, um, if we can ever reach the stage where we can seriously talk about future agreements, I'm one who's much more interested in stabilizing measures uh, than I am in numbers. I, I, I don't see a number reduction as uh, particularly in our interest, but uh, limits on new types, um, you know, stronger measures regarding new types of uh, strategic offensive arms, uh, appropriate verification measures, count, you know, counting rules, et cetera, that that's really where the focus should be. I think that's a really crucial insight. I, mean, I, I share Susan's instinct that it is much better to be, it would be much better to be stable at N, whatever N is, than unstable at one tenth N, um, as long as, you know, as long as N's not right. zero, I guess. But actually, I'm not sure I would want to be unstable at zero. And I think that one of the biggest challenges mm -hmm. of the disarmament conundrum is, is, is the worry that it might, in fact, be a very unstable world at zero, too. Uh, the, the late Thomas Schelling once made the point, I think, in an article in uh, Daedalus, that uh, in a world in which uh, you know, no one had forgotten how to make nuclear weapons, but we were at zero. Every crisis between a technology possessor who had a few dollars to spend would be a nuclear crisis in the sense that it would not merely be that countries that had a problem with each other could still race to build nuclear weapons, um, but that even worse, that world of zero would be a world in which you created powerful use incentives for anybody who gets there first. Let's say Susan and I have a squabble. We both know how to build nuclear weapons, but we don't have any because we live in a virtuous world that is abolished nuclear weapons. Uh, but if we have a bad enough squabble, you know Susan's gonna be racing secretly to reconstitute an arsenal, just as I will be. But it's not just that, it is that if she gets there first, she has an incredibly powerful reason to use that tool first before I finish reconstituting my arsenal. 
Um, you know, who, who doesn't want to be the, the, the power, the only possessor in a world of zero, right? So I worry that we have stability challenges even at zero. So absolutely, it is more important to be stable than to be at any given number. Now, it, you know, sure, at huge numbers, because the consequences of deterrence failing, which is, you know, always at least theoretically possible, are so high. Yeah, you don't want to be at huge numbers, but uh, but stability is is absolutely more important. Uh, yeah. you just, you know, if you had to err on one side or the other, go for stability, for God's sake. <laughs> Let me uh, follow up. This is a very important question for me is, some people have said our modernization program is starting an arms race. But let me ask you, is not our entire modernization program perfectly compatible with the New START Treaty? And if that's the case, people would be arguing that the New START Treaty is actually an arms race in and of itself. So in that light, is modernization compatible with the New START Treaty? But more importantly, is GBSD and the new ICBM, is that perfectly compatible with our arms control obligations? Completely compatible. Um, I mean, modernization is simply modernizing legacy tools. Uh, that's what our modernization program has been aiming to do for a long time. That is what has gotten bipartisan support across the U.S. political spectrum. Uh, this was an agenda item for the Obama administration. It was an agenda item for the Trump administration. God willing, it remains thus for U.S. administrations uh, for a long time to come. Um, we None of this makes any sense or supports our national security if our systems age out into obsolescence in place and we, in effect, unilaterally you know, disarm while our adversaries are geez, not even, not disarming, actually building right now, right? That's just lunacy. Um, so modernization isn't any kind of an arms race problem. Indeed, it would be awfully strange if we declined to do so while our adversaries are doing their best to race. I think the, uh, it's a, it's a, it may be a piece of, of, you know, Russian and Chinese propaganda that the U.S. modernization program contributes to an arms race, but all it means is that we opt to remain in place as opposed to falling behind even from a from a stable baseline and they're working very hard to to augment that baseline so in fact as time goes by unless we can get them to agree to restraint through an arms control process we will be stuck with a deteriorating numerical position which you know to some degree you can argue how much it matters to what degree but at some point it clearly will matter um, so I, the argument that modernization is a problem per se is silly and you don't hear us complaining about russian or chinese modernization from the perspective of whether or not an old missile still works and replacing it with one that does work. That's not a strategic problem. What they are doing that is a strategic problem that fuels arms racing is, is augmenting numbers, augmenting types of delivery system, mm -hmm. um, building up a range of capabilities that uh, for which we don't have an answer. And that's the reason why they are building them up. Uh, that is a strategic stability problem. That is an arms race problem. But modernization per se, that's just a silly little red herring. Susan. Um, well, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, actually I'd say that it, modernization is just the opposite of an incentive to um, an arms race. It's, uh, it's a precondition for any kind of progress on uh, non-proliferation and, uh, and arms limitations. Uh, okay, we're not in the same world we were in in the early 1980s under the Reagan and the Bush 41 administrations, but I think it holds true that as long as the United States is not modernizing, has a, a force that's going to be disarmament by rust. And, you know, we can't keep up <laughs> um, these systems indefinitely. Then what incentive do our adversaries have to engage in mutual arms limitation talks? That was very, very clear. That dynamic was very clear in the 1980s, and I think it would hold true today. It's also, from a proliferation perspective, for both our adversaries and our allies, for the United States to have credible forces to back up our deterrent threats is absolutely essential. I'm going to finish with two questions, one from our audience and one that uh, we and you can choose which one. Under the START One Treaty, we had portal monitoring of production facilities, and we had realistic and honest sharing of telemetry. We don't have those now. 
either one of you can answer the question, should we push to get those adopted in a new treaty or even an amendment to the current treaty? Chris, you, I think, talked a little bit about this. The second issue was from our audience, is there a problem with our extended deterrent policy of whether or not we can actually base nuclear weapons in a foreign country, particularly with respect to NATO versus uh, the Pacific? So Susan, why don't you start with, or excuse me, Chris, why don't you start with, pick one of them and we'll have Susan do the other one before we finish. <laughs> um, we got it, we got it. We're actually at 11 o'clock, but let, let me give you a couple minutes. I would say I've been talking mostly sort of from a strategic arms control perspective here. Let me sort of switch hats to my, uh, to, to the non-pro side and uh, say that, uh, and echo Susan's earlier comment that, that our extended deterrence policy isn't just about deterrence. It is about deterrence critically, but it is also inextricably related to to reassuring allies that our security guarantees mean something. Um, and that has a non-proliferation side as well. Um, we, it isn't simply that we're trying to send the message to potential adversaries that they will absolutely encounter a nuclear response uh, in the event that they try to you know, swallow up and destroy one of our one of our military allies. Um, it is also that we want our allies to understand that when they face the kinds of threats that they historically have and that they unfortunately of late are facing more of, um, that they need to know that we are there for them because our being there for them, including in an extended deterrence nuclear fashion, um, is part of answering what they need in order to be persuaded that their security, their existential security is actually met. Um, and were they not to feel that, uh, I mean, I, I take second chair to nobody in terms of my insistence upon non-proliferation policy and equity and principles, but uh, you know, it's a hard question to answer. If you imagined a uh, sort of a hypothetically grim future in which uh, you know, Russian and or Chinese threats to their to to their neighbors continued to skyrocket in the way that they have been in recent years. That their military power continued to to build up, their nuclear buildups continued unabated, and in that grim future, for some reason, it became clear that the United States alliance guarantees were worth nothing anymore. I, God forbid any future like this happens at all. But in that future, could you actually insist to? to, to you know, Poland or Estonia or, or, or Japan or South Korea or Taiwan, could you really tell them that it is their responsibility as a good non-proliferation citizen to sacrifice their very existence on the altar of Article 2 of the NPT? I mean, that's a hard thing to ask of somebody. You know, our objective is to make sure that that future doesn't arrive, um, but we have to acknowledge that our nuclear posture and the forward components of it are really critical to helping avoid the kinds of incentives that uh, uh, you know, not only to deter aggression, but to avoid the kind of incentives that would lead to potential proliferation uh, by countries that are threatened from the very strategic revisionism that I was referring to before coming out of Moscow and out of Beijing. Um, that's a really important benefit to the collective security of the international community that goes just beyond, far beyond merely us defending ourselves and our interests and those of our friends. And we've got to keep that in mind. There's a non-proliferation aspect of our alliance policy that um, it would be terribly, terribly mistaken to overlook and forget. Susan, you get the last word. <clears throat> okay, on um, perimeter portal continuous monitoring, PPCM. Uh, was first provided for in the INF Treaty and then uh, uh, carried over into START 1. It was agreed for a very, very specific purpose. Uh, the same factory produced the SS-20, which was banned by the INF Treaty, and the new SS-25 mobile ICBM, which was permitted. And so PPCM was established at that one factory to make certain that an SS-25 rolling out of the factory was not a banned SS-20. The two were quite similar. That reason has gone away. Um, and I can't imagine it coming back. Um, and also, oh, by the way, there had to be a reciprocal Russian presence at, uh, in Utah and uh, I don't know that we'd be very interested in that. Um, on telemetry, again, the telemetry from start one was extremely important because of the counting rule that 
we had to know the maximum number of warheads to which a missile was tested. And you could only know that with good telemetry data uh, for certain. Now it's a different counting rule. Uh, we count the number of warheads that we see during an inspection. I would advocate a return to the start one counting rule uh, because of the upload problem that you raised, Peter, and, and with it, the requirement for telemetry. But under the current new start counting rule, uh, it's more trouble than it's worth. Now, a return to the original capacity counting rule, uh, there would be a price. Uh, because our SLBMs would be uh, overcounted, and right. we'd have to check whether we were willing to pay that price. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank you both for a really extraordinary discussion. It really far beyond the discussion you see in most of the media and even literature on arms control. So thank you, Dr. Cook and and Dr. Ford. Uh, thank to you. To remind you of everybody thank on you. June June third. We are hosting the commander of Air Force Global Strike Command, General Tim Ray. And our discussion was to be on Thursday, June 3rd. Uh, he was our host of our last triad event, which we did in Global Strike Command uh, in December. And then I also wanna just say thank you to you both. Uh, extraordinary conversation. It's always wonderful to listen to your remarks and from Mitchell Institute and myself and my Boss General Deptula, uh, to our audience, uh, from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace day. And again, thank you, Dr. Ford, and thank you, Dr. Cook. I enjoyed it thoroughly, and we will talk to you later, hopefully in person at our next event. Sounds amazing. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank That's you. great. Next time we'll disagree, right, Chris? We'll kind of work out. We'll, we'll, we'll have to plan this carefully. Exactly right. We want some fireworks. <laughs> thank you. Take care. <laughs>